The Prosecutors is brought to you by Progressive. Progressive helps you compare direct auto rates from a variety of companies so you can find a great one, even if it's not with them. Quote today at Progressive.com to find a rate that works with your budget. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Comparison rates not available in all states or situations. One third of all murder cases in America remain open. He had told me that if I opened my eyes, he would slit my throat. Each one is called a cold case. The DNA evidence taken from the victim was a match. The linen rapist was at it again. Based on the hit A&E television program. A phone call is placed. One that changes a family's life forever. Cold Case Files, the podcast. You could see the fire in his eyes. He screamed at me. You want it? Get your tape recorder out. Get new episodes of Cold Case Files every Tuesday on Podcast One. Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and anywhere you listen to podcasts. Guys, you often tell us that your favorite episodes of our show are those that are mysterious and weird and have twists you would never see coming. Well, if you like those kind of shows, you're going to love Badlands. Have you ever asked yourself which muscled action star ran a jewelry theft ring as a teenager in Hawaii? How did a critically acclaimed actor get chewed out by the public and the police for a scandalous cannibalism kink, in which heiress turned actress found herself firing a submachine gun when she was kidnapped and brainwashed by a terrorist organization. These are just a few of the questions answered on an all new season of Badlands, a true crime podcast that digs into the real stories of the famous at their most infamous. With new episodes every Wednesday, host Jake Brennan dives deep into notorious characters of Tinseltown, deeper than ever before, featuring the insane true stories of John Belushi, Army Hammer, Charlie Chaplin, Lucille Ball, Bob Crane of Hogan's Heroes, Patty Hearst, and Dwayne The Rock Johnson. For all this and more, listen to Badlands wherever you get your podcast or binge the entire new season right now, only on Amazon Music. I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. And we are the Prosecutors. Today on the Prosecutors, a man makes a sandwich, programs his VCR to record the Super Bowl, and then disappears into thin air. and welcome to this episode of The Prosecutors. I'm Brett, and I'm joined, as always, by my unrivaled co-host, Alice. Unrivaled? Is this unrivaled. because we're going to be talking about the Super Bowl-ish? Yeah, well, yeah, ish, ish. <laughs> I know how much you love football, so that's one reason we want to talk about this case. I do love football. Yeah. We're not going to get into this. You yeah. guys have to go over to our other podcast, Legal Briefs, mm. to hear about my travails in footballness you can all hear about alice's time as a not a shot girl a what is it <laughs> what'd you call a it a drill team member a drill team member. a shot girl yeah not a shot girl you weren't a shot girl we talked about shot girls when we were talking about casey anthony so we're leaving that behind but i wasn't a shot girl but i was a beer babe at one time really <laughs> okay you gotta you gotta tell us more about this what does that mean <laughs> Exactly what it sounds like. I didn't hand out shots. I handed out cans of beer. Okay. As a beer babe. As a beer babe. Was this a job or was this just like a pastime? I mean, I think it was illegal is what it was because I was definitely mm. underage. It was in Austin on, you yeah, know, like the strip. And one of my friends, we were in high school. It's completely illegal. One of my friend's dads owned a really famous bar on 6th Street and we handed out beers and, and look we at you now. now you're in law enforcement so <laughs> kids don't do it kids delinquents like alice can grow up to be prosecutors so can you 
Everybody can turn their lives around. I, now, here, here's a lesson, though. I never took a sip of alcohol. That's remarkable. But, so, like, that, that makes a big difference. I did not take a sip of alcohol. I just handed out closed cans of beer. Well, this isn't even. I'm going to add beer babe. Beer babe? Is that what you called it? <laughs> beer, yes, babe, beer babe. It's your long resume, your long list of accomplishments. That one's going <laughs> right at the top. I probably made more as a beer babe than I do as a prosecutor. <laughs> you probably did. You probably did. Well, <laughs> well, you know, Alice, it's good that you mentioned Texas because actually this case is taking us to Texas. We're going to Amarillo, Texas, as a matter of fact. And we are going to talk about football because we're going to talk about the Super Bowl, the 1993 Super Bowl. When, kids, I know this is hard to imagine, but there was a time when the Dallas Cowboys were good at football. And it was a long time before most of you were born. But in 1993, they were really good at football to the extent that they were actually in the Super Bowl. Alice, do you remember when the Cowboys were in the Super Bowl? Were you born Absolutely. in 1993? Y yes, of course I was. I was not quite a beer babe yet, but I was on my way. <laughs> and yeah, Dallas Cowboys, they were America's team. Everyone loved them. Those were beautiful, mm. you know, outfits, costumes. <laughs> that's what Dallas likes to tell themselves, is that they were America's team. I don't know that that's actually true. Enough, I know, but... but when you were in Texas, that's what people say. Hey, I remember the beginning of Walker, Texas Ranger, it always featured the Dallas Cowboys. So, and that's where I, that's most of what I know about Texas comes from Walker, Texas Ranger and Dallas, the soap opera, which was awesome. But I feel like we may have gone just a also little, fantastic. little far afield of what we're doing tonight. We may have gone a little bit far afield because, you know, this case, we had promised last time that we were going to talk about a fascinating case that no one had heard about. So since no one's heard about this case, let's tell you a little bit about what we're talking about. It was January 28th, 1993, and David Lewis was excited. His beloved Dallas Cowboys were in the Super Bowl, and he was going to have the weekend to himself. His wife and daughter were leaving their Amarillo, Texas home that day to go on a shopping trip to Dallas. They'd be back on the 31st, the day of the big game. That Sunday, Karen Lewis and her daughter returned home to find things eerily quiet. But it was obvious that wherever David had gone, he didn't go far. The laundry was in the dryer and two fresh made turkey sandwiches were in the refrigerator. His wedding ring and wristwatch were sitting on the kitchen counter and the VCR was recording the Super Bowl. Karen expected David would be back any minute, but he didn't come back ever. And the strange clues and contradictory sightings of David would haunt the town of Amarillo and his family. That is, until 2004, when a bombshell discovery would answer one question and unleash many more. And I just got to say, I do not understand why this case is not famous. This is, hopefully you can already see, this is a crazy case. It's only get crazier. But this is a case that was recommended to us. So shout out to whoever it was who recommended it to us. Unfortunately, I didn't write down their name. So you can bathe in glory and let me know who you are and I'll mention you next time. But as I was going through cases looking for something to do, I keep a very long list of the cases that are recommended. And for whatever reason, I decided to look this one up. And as soon as I did, I knew this was a case we had to do. Essentially, the only podcast that I know of that's really done this case is The Trail Went Cold, which is a fantastic podcast. If you don't listen to it, you should. He has covered this case, and he did a very good job of it. But for the most part, this is a case that, for whatever reason, just hasn't really attracted people's attention. But it's one that I would hope that you guys will listen to. This is a old case, 1993. Now seems like a really long time ago. But there's a mystery here, and like we always say, there's probably somebody who knows something. And because this case hasn't gotten quite as much attention as you might expect, it's possible that there may be somebody out there hearing this case for the first time. So I want you to pay attention to what we're going to talk about and sort of take this journey with us into this case that should be famous in true crime because there are so many inexplicable things. I think that's probably enough. Run up. Let's talk about the timeline. Start in 1981, so go back even a little bit further. David Lewis is a relatively new lawyer. He had graduated from Texas Tech University Law School, magna cum laude. And it wasn't just that he was a lawyer at Texas Tech. He was a football hero in Texas. And as Alice has mentioned before, being a football hero in Texas is a big 
deal. And he wasn't just a high school hero. When he went to Texas Tech, he actually played quarterback for the Texas Tech Red Raiders. So this is a guy who's well known. He's athletic. Now he's gone to law school. He's graduated the top of his class. And in 1981, he marries Karen, who is a school teacher in Amarillo, Texas. And you can imagine somebody like David, when he comes back to a small town like Amarillo, it's not going to take long before he is going to become a pillar of the community. And that is exactly what happened. David, he goes into private practice. He works at a few different places, a few different firms, sort of finding his way before he joined the law firm of Buckner, Laura, and Swindale. And this would be the law firm that he would spend the rest of his career. But it wasn't just the law that fascinated David. As I said, he is going to become a very important person in his community, a person who is a leader in the community, not just on the business side, but also in charities and civic engagement. He becomes the president of the Dumas United Way. He is a Sunday school teacher in his local church. He is the director of a local literacy group and the leader of the local Boy Scout Council. So not someone that you would expect would be the subject of a true crime podcast. This is someone you would expect would be going from one success to another and eventually being one of the most important people in Amarillo, if not Texas itself. And as a matter of fact, five years later in 1986, Lewis becomes a judge and he's serving as Moore County Court at Law judge. And in that position, he's mostly handling cases involving teen juveniles, which is apparently something that David loved doing because he felt like he was able to make a difference in the community at a very basic level. He's changing kids' lives. He's getting involved with them before they become adults, before a life of crime becomes their life, and maybe he can actually turn things around. And he does this for four years. And in 1990, he decides he is going to try and take the next step. He is going to run for district court judge. Unfortunately, for whatever reason, it doesn't work out, and he loses his bid to be the court judge of the 69th district. And instead, he returns to full-time private practice. So he's done the judge thing. He's going to go back to private practice. And everything's going well for him until about 1992. At that time, a lawsuit is filed against him and other firm attorneys at an old firm he'd worked at. So not at the firm that he's at now, but one of his previous places of employment. And it's brought by an engine additive promoter that Lewis represented. So this seems like a pretty boring lawsuit. It is, but it is one where Lewis is being sued for his conduct as a lawyer. So this is a malpractice lawsuit. Now, Lewis had insurance as all lawyers in private practice do, because if there's one thing that every lawyer in private practice is going to experience at some point, it's disgruntled litigants who think if only you had done a better job, we would have won. And the plaintiffs in this case are seeking $3 million in their lawsuit. So that is sort of a, a kink. But as we're going to talk about, everyone who knew anything about this lawsuit thought it's going to be fine. This is not something that's going to affect David and his career. Right. And kind of unfortunately, in the litigation world, it is not completely uncommon to be sued. You know, it doesn't happen every day, but just because you are sued doesn't necessarily mean you did anything wrong. I think doctors and lawyers both have malpractice insurance for this very reason. But whenever you're sued and someone is seeking millions of dollars, it can make your blood pressure go up. Now, on Thursday, January 28th, 1993, Lewis leaves his firm at noon telling his fellow attorneys that he's not feeling well. He stops to buy gasoline, but he doesn't go home. His wife will say that she didn't see him that day, even though she was leaving for the weekend to go on a shopping trip. However, Lewis does show up at the community college, Amarillo College, to teach a government class that lets out around 10 p.m., On Friday, January 29th, a friend from church sees a man she believes is Lewis hurrying through the southwest terminal at Amarillo Airport. He has no luggage. That same day at 10.30 p.m., a police officer notices a red Ford Explorer, the same type of car Lewis drives, parked outside the Potter County Courts building. 
By the way, these sightings show you something about Amarillo. Amarillo is a relatively small town. People know each other. They know the cars that people drive. You know, this police officer knows Lewis from being around town because he's very involved in town, not because he knows his car from run-ins with the law. The fact that, you know, the airport's actually really small there. And so it would not be strange to see someone. This is not O'Hare Airport in Chicago. This is not Jackson Hartsfield Airport in Atlanta, where they're just hundreds of thousands of people passing through there. These are small airports and in these small towns, everyone's kind of looking around to see who sees who and word travels fast. So it's this type of sighting kind of gives you a flavor of the community that Lewis lives in. That is such an important point you've made. So I want to emphasize it. A lot of these cases, one of the things that's always really difficult to work through is which sightings are legitimate or not. You guys all know of cases where somebody goes missing and, you know, there's a sighting here and there's a sighting there. And you wonder if this person ran away, et cetera, et cetera. And then they find their body 10 feet from home in the forest. And all those sightings were false. And that really wasn't the person. And that is something that really is a challenge in any of these cases. These sightings are different. Like Alice said, these are people who knew this person. People in a small town with somebody who was important, who was well-known, and that people wouldn't have mistaken him for somebody else. We're going to talk about some sightings later, which might be different. But these sightings, I think you can take these to the bank. I think you can take to the bank that this friend from church who saw a man they thought was Lewis, it was him. We're going to have a photo. You guys who are watching on YouTube see it right now. There's really only one photo of Lewis that ever floats around. And he's very distinctive looking. Alice thinks he looks like he's from the 1950s, but it's a photo from the 1980s. He has these very large glasses on, very distinctive. The kind of person that you would know him if you saw him. And I, I think we can take these to the bank. These are very interesting things that are happening here. As we've said, January 31st is going to be the day. That's going to be the last day that there's any evidence of Lewis being in Amarillo, and we don't really know what happened to him after that. So as we've said before, whenever you have a mystery, the days leading up to it, you're going to spend a lot of time scrutinizing those. You start with the 28th. This is really the last time he's seen at work, and he tells his fellow attorneys he's not feeling well, and so he's going to go home. But he doesn't go home, right? I mean, he goes somewhere else. We don't know where he goes. We know he leaves home early. We know that his wife never sees him, so he doesn't actually go home. We know at some point he shows up for this night class he's teaching at Amarillo College that lets out at 10. So the question that I have is, where is he between when he left work and when he shows up for his class? Because he's not at home. And also, he's clearly not that sick, if in fact he was sick, to show up to teach a class pretty late at night. You know, 10 o'clock, it probably started at 7, 8 p.m. And so we have about seven or eight hours unaccounted for. Maybe he felt better during that time, but usually if you're feeling sick, you do something about it. You go to the doctor, you go to the pharmacy, you go home to take a rest before you have to teach that night because he's very responsible and wants to make sure he, you know, fulfills his obligations. But there's no indication that he took any of those steps that you, you may expect someone to take if they are in fact not feeling well. And I know there's somebody out there saying, come on, guys, everybody says they don't feel well so they can leave work early. He had a long weekend coming up where he's going to watch the football game. Totally get that. But once again, he doesn't just go home. He is in the wind for some period of time. And given what happens, the fact that we don't really know where he was for a significant chunk of time from noon to what, eight, probably when this class started, maybe a little later in Amarillo College. I think it's interesting. We do not have an answer for you for where he is. We just know he's missing. And then on Friday, you see him hurrying through the airport with no luggage. He's going somewhere with no luggage. That's an interesting thing to me. Also, I want you to know, Alice talked about the car being parked at the courthouse. It's there at 1030 PM. I don't know how many of you guys know this, but court officers don't work at 1030. The courts are closed. So the fact that the car is there, it seems like it's been left there. 
But if Lewis was at the airport, why is his car at the courthouse? And how did he get from the courthouse to the airport? There is something going on here that we just don't know. Right. Because remember, his family is out of town, so they can't take him to the airport. No one has stepped up and said that he was taken to the airport by them. And the courthouse to the airport is not within walking distance. And this is pre-Uber and Lyft days. So he couldn't call some app service. He may have called a taxi, but there's no record of this on a credit card or anything like that. Now, let's talk about the next day, Saturday, January 30th. Someone deposits $5,000 into Lewis's bank account, and a neighbor notices that Lewis's Explorer is parked in his driveway, and the police officer notices that the red Explorer is no longer parked in front of the court building. What all this says right here is that likely the neighbor did see Lewis's Explorer in his driveway because it's consistent with the fact that the police officer notices this red Explorer is gone. This police officer probably noticed this because they're patrolling the area. Court buildings, federal, state, local buildings for the judiciary are typically monitored pretty closely because they are targets for domestic terrorism, for people who are disgruntled with the court system. So it is typically on a patrol cops route. And so it is completely conceivable that he'd be riding by there at 1030 in the evening and earlier the next morning, he would probably roll by there on his route. And a car that was there when the courts were not open that is then gone is something that would be noticeable. So all this is to say is it does appear that Lewis's Explorer went back home at some point on that Saturday. Now, someone purchased a return ticket from Dallas to Amarillo in Lewis's name, and there was no outgoing flight from Amarillo to Dallas. Now, those of you who may not know Texas geography, Dallas to Amarillo is about a five and a half, almost six hour drive. It's about an hour and a half flight. So relatively quick flight, obviously within driving distance because Lewis's wife and daughter were driving there for the weekend, but that's why they were going for the whole weekend. Amarillo is a small town, not a lot of shopping there. Dallas is a huge, you know, metropolis, a lot of shopping available there. And it's not uncommon for people to drive from the surrounding areas to spend a weekend shopping in Dallas where all the big name stores are. What's so interesting is we see at least on Saturday, sometime during the day, Lewis's car is in Amarillo and there is a ticket bought in his name, not for his wife, not for his daughter, in his name coming from Dallas back to Amarillo. So how did he get from Amarillo to Dallas if his car was seen in Amarillo? So couple things interesting about this day, and we got one more thing to mention, but a few things about this that are interesting. This $5,000 that ends up in the bank account, that's a lot of money back in 1993. It's a lot of money now, but it was more money back then. Also, you got Lewis is in the airport in Amarillo on Friday. Sounds like he went to Dallas. We don't have a record of that ticket. Be interesting to know who bought that ticket. This is pre-9-11. This is another problem, so really... It is hard to track people and where they're going and when they're going. We just know that this Dallas to Amarillo ticket was purchased in Lewis's name. We've never found the ticket that would have gotten him to Dallas, but it seems like that's where he went. And then somebody buys his ticket. Sounds like he flies back, picks up his car and drives it back to his house. All this happens in the span of less than 24 hours. So. That's all interesting, and it seems there's something weird going on here, something conspiratorial going on there. But then Lewis does something that's so ordinary and pedestrian and domestic that it just makes you think, what in the world is going on? Now, according to Robin Warder on The Trail Went Cold, a local told him that David also pulled out $50 from his account to possibly purchase a basketball goal for his 10-year-old daughter. He told the seller he was interested in the goal, but he wanted to wait till his wife returned from her shopping trip to make the final decision. I mean, that doesn't sound like something somebody does when they're about to disappear or when they're involved in some sort of unknown conspiracy that has them jet setting around Texas and getting $5,000 deposited into their account, right? Then you go out and buy a basketball goal or you don't even buy it. You need your wife to look at it when she gets back. It is just completely incongruous, those two things. 
what's going on here, what's about to happen, and him stopping to buy a basketball goal. Just bizarre. And it only gets weirder. I mean, it's just... Okay, so now we're on January 31st. Sunday, January 31st. Super Bowl Sunday. The Dallas Cowboys are going to be playing the Buffalo Bills. And, spoiler alert, they're going to win. But that morning, a sheriff's deputy sees a man who looks like Lewis, which means it probably was Lewis, because as we said, everybody knows everybody, standing near the Potter County Courts Building. This is the Courts Building we've been talking about. The thing that struck the deputy is that this man was taking pictures of a red Ford Explorer parked out front. So that Ford Explorer has come back to the Courts Building. It's parked at the Courts Building. But for reasons that no one really knows, it appears that Lewis is taking pictures of his own car, or at least someone who looks very much like him. And once again, this is a sheriff's deputy who should know what Lewis looks like. So sounds like Lewis is taking pictures of his own car. Who knows why? But what we know for sure is that night, Lewis's wife and daughter return home. They've come back from Dallas. They've come back from their shopping trip, and they fully expect to find Lewis home celebrating the victory of the Dallas Cowboys. But instead... He is nowhere to be seen. They suspected that it was possible that he was just out celebrating the Cowboys' victory. Maybe he'd met up with some friends at a bar or whatever. But he never returned that night. The weirdest thing is the only clothing that they noticed was missing was a pair of green sweatpants. Now, on that day, someone purchased a return ticket. Once again, just a return ticket from LAX, Los Angeles Airport, to Dallas in Lewis's name. We don't know the outgoing flight, and we don't know what was going to happen when this person, if it's Lewis, arrived in Dallas, given that that's not where he lives, but that is where the ticket was from and where it was going. And again, just, you know, for a little bit of geography, LAX to Dallas is like a 21 hour drive or a four and a half hour flight. So not close at all. And Los Angeles to Amarillo is about the same. It's a 15 hour, 16 hour drive. So again, an entire day's drive and it's not in any way close to Amarillo. And I don't know that the Lewises had any ties to Los Angeles either. So this is a much stranger ticket than the previous one we saw from Dallas to Amarillo, but both are strange in that there's no outgoing flight to get him to those places. Well, let's get even weirder. So Monday, February 1st, which is the day that Lewis's wife will report him missing to the police, a Dallas cab driver picks up a man at a hotel in Dallas who matches Lewis's description. The man is nervous, and when they arrived at the airport, he fumbled with a wad of $100 bills to pay the man. Once again, this is 1993. I know taxis can be expensive, but there's no way the taxi cost $100. So the fact that he's paying him with a $100 bill is strange in of itself. The fact that he has a wad of $100 bills is also strange. Now, let me caution you on this. We've talked a lot about sightings and how those sightings are almost certainly rock solid. This sighting is different. This is a Dallas cab driver who doesn't know Lewis from Adam. He is going to later on say that this man matched the description. It was a man he remembered because of this unusual thing. The $100 bills, the way he was nervous, he's fumbling for them. That's why he remembers what the man looked like. And the man certainly, according to him, matches the description of Lewis. It's possible, 100% possible, that it could have been somebody else. The number of people in Dallas in 1993 who probably looked like Lewis might be pretty high. And the number of people who take cabs to the airport on any given day is probably pretty high. But given everything we know, given everything we know about the return tickets, the fact that Dallas has come up twice, the fact that Lewis has now disappeared, the fact that the man was nervous, makes you think this may actually be a legitimate sighting of Lewis who somehow has made it to Dallas. And he didn't make it in his red Ford Explorer. As I said, on that day, Lewis is reported missing. Police immediately start to look for him, and it doesn't take them long at all to find his red Ford Explorer. And guess where it was parked? It was parked at the Potter County Courts building, the same place it had been the other two times people noticed his vehicle. 
The keys are inside, hidden under the driver's side floor mat. This is a Ford Explorer, and I have owned a Ford Explorer. And the best thing, maybe not the best thing, but one of my favorite things about the Ford Explorer is its keyless entry keypad on the door. Ford Explorers have had this since like 1980. I looked it up. They've been around for forever. And the great thing about it is, you know, you could drive your Ford Explorer wherever you wanted to go. Say you want to go, you know, running or you want to go to a trail. You park your car, you take your keys. You don't want to take them with you. So you throw them under the floor mat, you lock the door, and then when you come back, you can just use the keypad to get in. So that's what I think was happening here. I think Lewis or whoever drove the car, but probably Lewis, when he parked the car, he just left his car keys under the floor mat because he knew whenever he came back, he just used the keypad and get in. I think that's really important. This is his car that they find in front of the court building because I think it lends credence to the fact that the previously cited sightings of the Red Florida Explorer in front of the Potter County Courts building by that sheriff deputy is correct. It was very likely that the previous sightings were also David, and we know that it moved at some point during that weekend and went back there. So here's what's strange. I don't find the fact that his keys are in the car that strange. I hate taking my keys with me on a flight because I'm always afraid I'm going to lose them. I'm going to leave them at the hotel or something, and I won't be able to drive my car when I get back. So that doesn't strike me as that strange. But what does strike me as strange is what else they found in the car. The police found his checkbook, his driver's license, which would be a big deal now because you can't even get on a plane without a driver's license. 1993, different story. And his credit cards. So he doesn't have his checkbook which back in 1993 was a big deal because you actually wrote checks back then for a lot of things. He doesn't have that, and he doesn't have his credit cards. So all he has is whatever cash is on him, and he doesn't have any identification. He doesn't have his driver's license. All of that is left in this car. Since I'm like obsessed with the geography of all this, just so you guys have a sense, the Potter County Courthouse is about nine miles from the Amarillo airport. So not really walking distance. If you had a ride, sure, it's only, you know, like a 15 minute drive, but kind of not an obvious place to park your car if you're going to the airport. And I just think it's so strange that he keeps parking his car at the courthouse. Why is he doing that? His office is a few miles down the road. Honestly, parking it at the courthouse is the most conspicuous place you could park it. If he just drove it to the airport, that would be one thing. Now, obviously, it seems like he doesn't want people to know he's flying somewhere. But I just don't understand. I mean, I guess, as I'm saying this, you leave it at the courthouse. If someone picks you up at your house, there, someone's liable to see it. If you park it at the courthouse, you can walk around the corner, get in somebody's car on the curb. Then your car is not at the airport. I mean, I guess maybe it makes as much sense as anywhere. I'm looking at the map here and like three miles away is a Walmart super center. I don't know if it was there in 1993, but I would think a big shopping center parking lot would be a lot more conspicuous because no one would notice a car if, you know, hundreds of cars are there over the weekend and you could easily be picked up there unnoticed as well. And it's not strange for you to be at, say, a Walmart. And that's a good point. Even if the Walmart wasn't there, there was a mall in Amarillo. In 1993, I guarantee they could have parked there. So it is, it's a little unusual, but who can say? And look, the police, they looked into this. Lewis was an important person. He wasn't the kind of person that they just wouldn't have looked into. He's not, you know, unfortunately we see a lot of cases with folks that slip through the cracks because the police don't care. They cared about Lewis and they investigated this a lot and they put a lot of resources into it. And it was like he had just vanished into thin air. Other than what we've told you up to this point, that was basically all the police had. And they had really no idea what happened to him. I pulled an article from newspaper.com and I will put that on the website so you can read it. But just a, just you, and when you read it, you'll see the police are like, we have no idea. He just vanished. Crazy. Brett, we've got a very different kind of sponsor for this episode, The Jordan Harbinger Show, a podcast you should definitely check out since you're a fan of our podcast. And the show covers such a wide range of topics through weekly interviews with heavy hitting guests. And there are a ton of episodes you'll find interesting such as the True Crime Starter Pack that you can find on Jordan Harbinger's website. You can learn about Billy McFarland from Firefest fiasco to federal prison and also Freeway Rick Ross, Life in the Crack Lane, and so much more. 
That's right, Alice. Now is the time to binge the Jordan Harbinger show because there's an episode for everyone, no matter what you're into. The show covers stories like how a professional art forger somehow made millions of dollars while being chased by the feds and the mafia. The podcast covers a lot, but one constant is his ability to pull useful pieces of advice from his guests. I promise you, you'll find something useful that can apply to your own life. We really enjoy this show, and we think you will as well. Search for The Jordan Harbinger Show. That's H-A-R-B as in boy, I-N as in Nancy, G-E-R on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. The Prosecutor's Podcast is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Let's face it, sometimes multitasking can be overwhelming. Like when your favorite podcast is playing and the person next to you is talking and your car fan is blasting, all while you're trying to find the perfect parking spot. But then again, sometimes multitasking is easy, like quoting with Progressive Insurance. They do the hard work of comparing rates so you can find a great rate that works for you, even if it's not with them. Give their nifty comparison tool a try and you might just find getting the rate and coverage you deserve is easy. All you need to do is visit Progressive's website to get a quote with all the coverages you want, like comprehensive and collision coverage or personal injury protection. Then you'll see Progressive's direct rate and their tool will provide options from other companies all lined up and ready to compare. So it's simple to choose the rate and coverages you like. Press play in comparing auto rates. Quote at Progressive.com to join the over 27 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Comparison rates not available in all states or situations. Prices vary based on how you buy. Alice, as everybody knows, I've been sick a lot lately for some reason, and I'm so glad that I had Tivic clear up to help me with sinus pain and congestion, heaviness in the face and eyes, headaches, runny nose, watery eyes, all the things that come with a cold or with allergies. And a lot of times over-the-counter and prescription drugs, they have side effects, messy sprays, they're a hard way to live for many people suffering from these conditions. And I'm here to tell you that Tivit Clear Up is a revolutionary product that will change your life forever. It is an easy to use FDA approved medical device that fits in the palm of your hand. Created by doctors and neuroscientists, Tivit Clear Up stops suffering by using bioelectronic technology to reduce sinus pain and congestion. Simply glide Tivit Clear Up on areas of your face where you are experiencing sinus pain. Try Tivic Clear Up today with a 60 day risk free trial. Go to TivicHealth.com, that's T I V I C Health.com, and enter promo code PROSECUTORS22 to receive $20 off plus free shipping on your Clear Up device. Tivic Clear Up works when nothing else can. Alice, summer is ending and it's time to soak in those last bit of summer sun. HelloFresh Market is a one-stop shop for all mealtime needs with a curated selection of quick breakfast, lunches, snacks, desserts, and more. And you can gear up for the busy fall season with 55 weekly options and take the stress out of meal planning and preparing. From family-friendly to fit and wholesome and even veggie, HelloFresh has tasty and nutritious meals sure to please everyone. And Brett, I just love that these quick and easy recipes can make an entire meal for my family in 20 minutes. The other day we had the crispy kicking cayenne chicken cutlets and my boys were jumping up and down wanting seconds. And it's just so easy to have everything right there for you and cleanup is fast. So please go to HelloFresh.com slash TP16 and use code TP16 for 16 free meals across seven boxes and three free gifts. That's HelloFresh.com slash TP16 and use code TP16 for 16 free meals across seven boxes and three free gifts. And find out for yourself why HelloFresh is America's number one meal kit let's remember where Lewis is in his life. Sure, there was that lawsuit filed the year before against not just him, though, you know, his former firm. So it's not singling him out for some bad action. He has a wife that he's seemingly happily married to. He has a 10-year-old daughter. They do well, well enough for, you know, mother and daughter to go off to the big city, Dallas, for a weekend of shopping. He's enjoying the things that he likes in life, such as football. And he has a good job at this law firm. And he's respected in his community and well known by everyone. He's in church. He knows the local sheriff deputies. He is connected to his community. 
and seemingly without any notice, he disappears. So let's talk about some unusual aspects as if not everything about this case is unusual. First, let's talk about the state of the home. As we said earlier, there were many reasons to believe Lewis just stepped out. His watch and wedding ring were on the kitchen counter, perhaps indicating he'd been washing dishes at some point that night and fresh laundry was in the dryer. Then there were the sandwiches freshly made and the VCR, which had been manually started to record the Super Bowl, but never shut off. Now, those of you who are too young to know about VCRs, VCRs use tapes with quite literally like a, a spool of tape and it runs out after typically a couple of hours. It does not have unlimited space like your phone or a CD-ROM or a DVD. It cannot run for I don't know. What was the, what's the runtime on these? Like this conversation makes me feel so old. <laughs> well, there, you could set it for different, different things where like, if you wanted it to be really high quality recording and to last, you would do it where it only lasted like two and a half hours, three hours, but you could do like very long recording where you could get like eight hours on the tape. But if you watch that tape a few times, whatever you watch was going to, the quality was going to degrade. So yeah, I mean, max, we're talking eight hours here probably more like four on the VCR tape. And I'm trying to remember, maybe we had some fancy VCR where you could set the time, <laughs> but what I remember is you had to press the red button for, it was like two buttons you pressed at one time to record and you had to physically press it. This is something I question about this case because what you always read is that this VCR was manually started and you're absolutely right. So you'd put the tape in and there were a couple ways you could do it. You could just push the record button and it would literally, man, this makes you feel old. It would literally start to record whatever it was you were watching on TV at the time. So whatever was on the television, when you hit record, it would start to record, right? It's kind of like your DVR. You can do that with your DVR, but yes, not all VCRs, but the fancier ones, <laughs> probably a 1993, a pretty fancy one, you could set to record. And, you know, some VCRs, it was just a time thing. You set it to record a certain time. Other VCRs, you could do the channel and it would actually change the channel for you, which was super fancy. And I mean, I can remember in college, I used to record the football games, which I don't know why I did that because when I went to college, Alabama was terrible, but I would take my VCR tape and put it in there and, and you could set it to record. So it would start recording or whatever, but what everybody says in this case is this was manually set to record, which means for those of you who don't know about the Super Bowl, I mean, you know, Alice has seen all the Super Bowls, so she probably certainly understands that. You know, I mean, the Super Bowl starts around five o'clock or so. It's pretty early. It's not like most sporting events. It starts pretty early. So Lewis would have had to have been at his home and the Super Bowl, what everybody says is it was recorded. So you could have watched that Super Bowl on that tape. He would have had to have been at his home or someone would have had to have been at his home as late as five o'clock on that Sunday and hit record, push the button and hit record. And whatever happened to him had to have happened after he did that. Now, so the recording was started, but no one ever shut it off. There was no sign of foul play, no indication of a break in and nothing. Again, remember, this is a small town. The neighbor noticed when his car was in the driveway and not. If there had been any sort of ruckus, I do think this community, this neighborhood would have noticed something, but there's no signs of it. No one reported hearing anything. So what could have caused David to leave so abruptly when his beloved Dallas Cowboys were playing in the biggest game of the year? I mean, look, this is crazy. I, I just, I, I don't want to harp on this, but this is crazy. I mean, this is like going all the way back to episode three or whatever it was four when we did the lighthouse. And we talked about how the, the old legends about how when people showed up, the food was still hot on the table and the chair was kicked over and it looked like they were in the middle of dinner and they just leapt up and disappeared, right? And we debunked that because that's just silly. It's a legend, you know, that doesn't ever happen. That's exactly what happened here. You got a guy who's just put the laundry in the, in the dryer or the washer, whichever it is. He's just put the laundry in the machine. He's made himself a couple sandwiches, which he's got in the refrigerator, which apparently he's going to eat. He looks like he's washing dishes because this is what I do. If I'm going to wash dishes and I'm still wearing my, my wedding ring and my watch, I take them off and I set them on the counter. 
because I don't want them to get wet and soapy and everything else. And I wash the dishes and sometimes I forget about them, but whatever, that's what I do. And he started the recording of the Super Bowl. Everything about this is indicating that the man intends to be there that night. He's going to watch the Super Bowl. He's going to eat some sandwiches. He's going to switch over the laundry. And then when his wife gets home, she's going to be happy that he washed the dishes. That's what he's planning on doing. And yet, despite all that, he just disappears <laughs> into thin air. And I mean, wow, right? What, what in the world? Yeah, everything seems so normal and mundane laundry pre-made dinner like he's so responsible he wanted two sandwiches he had them made i don't i'm not gonna lie i never make sandwiches and put them in the fridge ahead of time but maybe he made them and his hands were wet from you know dishwashing so he didn't want them to get warm put them in the fridge everything indicates a completely normal day evening at home obviously alice he wants to see the commercials he's doing that so the food's ready <laughs> and whenever he wants it he just runs in grabs food he doesn't miss anything doesn't miss any of the game doesn't miss any of the commercials and this is why some people are like oh there are two sandwiches that means there were going to be two people no no i mean number one nobody ever makes one sandwich for themselves unless it's a snack right it's not like you're making like a big sub or something your sandwich is gonna be very what? small like <laughs> usually when i eat sandwiches i eat at least two. Oh no are you making fun of my sub today at lunch no, your sub was massive today at lunch. You would not have eaten two. I mean, guys, I can't even tell you. It came on two plates. <laughs> yeah, it literally came on two plates. Like, we're all having the, the lunch special with, like, the little tiny sandwich and the chips and the Coke. And then Alice, it's like a some sort of presentation when she gets her massive sandwich. Anyway, when you make them at home, they're small. He was making those sandwiches, so when he got hungry, when he's sitting in his recliner with his feet kicked up, watching the Dallas Cowboys crush the Buffalo Bills, he's going to be able to eat as many sandwiches as he wants. That's what he's doing. And I'm sorry, no one would think to do this. This is not, to me at least, this is not staged. This is not some brilliant kidnapper who's come up with the perfect way to make it look like he's there by making some sandwiches, washing the dishes, and starting the laundry. That's not happening. This man is living two lives on the one hand he's flying off to amarillo and he's got these tickets and all this other crazy stuff's happening on the other hand he's looking at a basketball goal for his 10 year old and making sandwiches for the super bowl just crazy stuff and it's totally inconsistent yeah, that's a really good point about the sandwiches. I didn't understand the sandwiches in the fridge until you said that. And then I think back to my dad, like when I was little, and you're totally right. He'd have like snacks set up on the kitchen counter, ready to grab at the commercial breaks and then like run back to the recliner, exactly as you say. And it would be such a strange thing for, you know, some kidnapper to stage to make it seem like David was actually there about to grab yeah. his sandwich. I mean, it's just wild. But I mean, I hate to really dismiss anything because this is such a crazy case so there's that that's the house let's go back to the courthouse what in the world was he doing at the courthouse like why does he keep parking there there are people who speculated he was doing work there but his office wasn't in the courthouse he was a lawyer but his office wasn't there and like i said the courthouse wouldn't have been open his office was actually about three miles from the courthouse so if he was going in to do work he would have gone there and it's the weekend the court building's not going to be open it seems to me that as we said earlier the only reason you would be there is it's just a place to leave your car. He would have known, for instance, that no one else would be there. His car's not going to get towed. It's a safe place to park his car. It might have gotten a little bit more notice than he expected because there were a lot of people who noticed it. Now, one thing I can't explain is this whole taking pictures thing. That, I, I don't, I mean, I don't know what's going on there if it was him. But once again, like so many things in this case... That's just a fact that's really hard to explain. I have no idea. This really boggles my mind. There's no reason to be at the courthouse at those hours. The courthouse is just not open. You could not even get in the courthouse unless you had a key and worked there. And at this point, he was not a judge. So he had no access to the buildings. I just, I am, I don't know. This completely boggles my mind as to why he was repeatedly at this building. Now, another thing, what is going on with these plane tickets? Why were there only return tickets in Lewis's name, and where were the outgoing tickets? No other tickets were found in his name. It's also unclear when these tickets were for, though Lewis was spotted in the airport on the 29th. So it's possible that, you know, this represented at least one of his outgoing flights. But if Lewis flew from Amarillo, why was there no record of it at all? And if he was flying under a different name, 
Why? And also, I think it would have been hard for Lewis to fly from Amarillo in a different name because this is the place where everybody knew him. So it would have been very strange for his, you know, church friend to walk by and be like, Lewis, what you doing? And the, you know, check-in lady is like, Lewis, I hear a Mr. Mr. Blank. And so it's just a very risky thing to do. And also, where did he get the identification, you know, to be able to prove he was that different name to fly out? And if you're going to fly under a different name, why not just fly back under the different name? Why fly back with your real name, especially when you're flying back with no identification? His identification for his real name is, remember, in Amarillo. And that's what's so crazy about this, because you think he's doing it under a different name. That's why he left his driver's license, because he has another ID. And that's what he's going to use. Okay, that sounds good. Brilliant. Good theory. Why is he buying the return tickets under his own name? What is going on there? Why is that happening? I, I mean, once again, just 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 sort of an inexplicable thing. It just doesn't it doesn't make any sense. If you're being so careful to hide your identity and hide the fact that you're flying in and out of these airports, why do you slip up and buy the two return tickets in your own name? I mean, maybe you did just slip up. Maybe that's what happened, but. As Alice said, it's going to suck when you left your ID in your car and then, oops, I bought my tickets under my real name. So now I've got to figure that out, right? I mean, just weirdness. I mean, just bizarre, inexplicable stuff. And I got to tell you guys, if y'all got theories flying through your head right now, I want you to share them with us because I've thought about this case a lot <laughs> since, since we decided to do it. And these are things that, that I just... I have a real difficult time explaining. So here's a question. Was David in danger before he disappeared? So after he disappeared, his wife would tell police that he did indeed fear for his life. Apparently, he had told her that he had been threatened by some former defendants and recall he was in the middle of a lawsuit when he disappeared. In fact, he was due to be deposed in that lawsuit the week after he disappeared. So he disappears on a Sunday that week, that coming week, he was supposed to be deposed in that case. And interestingly, his file on the case mysteriously disappeared along with David. Now the lawsuit was the result of some work that he had done at a prior law firm, as I said earlier, and he had told a relative that he thought that firm might have some liability, but he planned to tell the truth whatever was to happen. So there were people who probably were concerned about the fact that David was about to give this deposition. So maybe his disappearance was related to that. Now, interestingly, the attorney who represented him in this lawsuit dismissed all this. He said, look, Lewis was up to date on his malpractice insurance. He had no liability. Yes, he had some information, but it wasn't even that damaging. Just the idea that anybody would do something to him about this doesn't seem right. And a lot of this information comes from Mrs. Lewis and the police did not believe her. In fact, she had refused to take a polygraph, which as we've said before, we don't put a lot of stock in polygraphs, but the police do. And they take a lot of stock when you refuse to do one. They assume that you must have something to hide. I wouldn't take one because I know I'd fail it, whether I was guilty or not. But nevertheless, the police, when she refused to take that polygraph, they thought, you have something to hide. You're not telling us everything. So you guys are probably sitting out there thinking, well, this is obvious. You guys keep acting like this is some big mystery. It's not a big mystery. One of two things happened. Either one of these defendants killed him, probably buried him out in the West Texas oil fields or something, or his wife killed him. And this whole like going shopping thing was just a cover and he's probably buried in the backyard under the flowers, right? That is what you're saying. And those were some brilliant theories. And I want you guys to be very proud of the theories you came up with about that because we are here to tell you they are not true because in 2004, we learned something that changed everything about the way you think about this case. So, more than 10 years after David disappeared into thin air, the Washington State Patrol detective Patrick Ditter had some time on his hands and was looking through some old cold case files. 
he found a John Doe that intrigued him. The man had been walking down the street just outside Moxie, Washington, a small town of only 3,000 people. And it's smack in the middle of the state near the Yakima Indian Reservation and the United States Military Yakima Training Center. It was around 10.30 p.m. on February 1st, 1993. A car passed him in the night and upon realizing that he was dangerously close to the road, decided to turn around. But when they found the man on the side of the road, he was dead, having been struck in a hit and run. A red Chevrolet Camaro was seen leaving the scene of the accident. The man was wearing camouflage clothing and work boots. He had no identification, and when police ran his fingerprints, nothing came back. He had no alcohol or drugs in his system. He was a mystery, and he was buried as a John Doe because they couldn't figure out who this person was. Ditter started digging. He pulled up missing persons from around the same time. He pulled up David Lewis's photo and was shocked. He looked just like the John Doe, save for the glasses David wore. But when Ditter pulled up the inventory list of the John Doe's belongings, he found the very same glasses listed. They'd been in his coat when he was struck. Ditter's John Doe was David Lewis and DNA testing would later confirm it. You know, this is a podcast that's clean. We've managed to avoid the little E next to our podcast for a long time. So I'm not going to ruin that, but there are many expressions that I feel like I could utter right now that are related to this because this is the craziest thing I have ever heard. So this guy is sitting in Amarillo making his sandwiches, washing his dishes. He's getting the laundry ready. That's on January 31st. (laughs) January 31st, the next day on February 1st, he's walking down the road in Yakima, Washington and gets hit by a Camaro and killed. And he's wearing work boots and camouflage clothing. Alice is probably, even as we speak, figuring out exactly how far it is from Amarillo to, to Yakima, Washington, but 24 hour drive. Yeah. So, so let's, let's go through this. Let's go through this timeline. He could not have driven there. We know that much. So let's, let's just walk through this. Let's walk through this. Okay. We said earlier, the Super Bowl would have begun at around 5 PM on January 31st. Texas is in central time. 5 PM is about when it would start. So David would have needed to start the recording of the game manually. And remember it was recorded. So. It's possible that he started the recording a little earlier. We don't know exactly how much of the pregame he got. We don't know all those details, but he had to have done it sometime around five o'clock. That had to happen. 30 hours later, he's dead. 30 hours is all we have to work with. So some have noted that the courthouse where David had parked was near a bus station, but Moxie is 1,600 miles from Amarillo. Even driving nonstop, as Alice said, it's a 24-hour drive. Buses don't drive nonstop. There's no way he could have gotten there from the bus station to Moxie. He had to have flown. And this makes it even more likely that that man that was seen in Dallas in the morning of February 1st paying with a $100 bill was David. So he gets to Dallas from Amarillo. He starts the recording for whatever reason he leaves in haste. Somehow he gets to the airport. He flies to Dallas. For some reason, he spends the night in Dallas. Then on February 1st in the morning, he goes back to the airport. He could have flown to Seattle. He also could have flown to Tacoma. That's about it. Those are the two options though. How he got from there to Moxie in the middle of the state is a complete mystery. He could have hitchhiked. Maybe he rented a car though. We don't have any record of that. It's also possible. He could have caught a small plane, a puddle jumper from one of those airports to Yakima airport, which was about 10 miles away from where he was found. Now where he got the clothes, we don't know. He didn't own anything like them. 
he would have had to have picked them up along the way or hidden them from his wife so that she wouldn't have known. So it's not impossible for him to have made this trip, but he would have had to have been booking it. And as we've said, we talked about return tickets. They go to places like LA. He has no connection to Washington whatsoever. So how in the world did he end up there? Why was he there? Why was he wearing what he was? And how did he end up at John Doe on the side of the road? Whew. That is like one of the craziest bombshells in any case I've ever read. And if it were not for this detective who just had some time on his hands, we would have never known that he was dead and that he was found 24 hours driving from his home. Yeah, I mean, great work by that guy, right? <laughs> I mean, apparently he read an article about cold cases getting solved and was like, oh, I'll look into this. And then he uses, you know, he did some real fancy investigative work. He basically used this newfangled thing called Google and he <laughs> put this information into Google and then up pops this picture of, of David Lewis. And he's like, Hey, that looks like my guy. And, and sure enough, it is. And just as Alice said, I mean, this is 11 years later. And all of you who are waiting for us to have some great reveal about what happened here. I mean, this is, this is right up there with Brian Schaefer with mystery or Blair Adams. I mean, at least we know Blair Adams basic trajectory and we can theorize that there were some mental issues going on there. And there was prior evidence of mental issues with David Lewis. Everything's fine. He feels sick on Thursday and by Monday he's dead 1600 miles away. And people have speculated maybe it has something to do with the military because of the Tacoma military base. Maybe it does. I have no idea. We do theories. We always do theories. It's one of the things you guys like about this case. I have no idea. I mean, Alice, you got any? I have one maybe, but here's a really confusing thing. There does not seem to be any sort of strife at home. Maybe, I mean, you never know what's going on in someone's marriage, but he seemed to be fine with his daughter. He was thinking about buying a basketball goal for his daughter. His daughter's only 10 years old. You know, she's not some young adult who might be having some emotional issues or some big relational problems with her dad. Seemingly everything at home is just fine. There are no indications that anything is wrong there, except for the fact that not only does David not see his family before they leave for the day, even though he's leaving work early, he never calls them. He knows they will be home by Super Bowl Sunday and they will know he's not there and he's over in Dallas. He doesn't call them. It seems like he never intends to let them know what is going on. And because of all this, I don't know. I mean, truly, there's just not enough here for us to actually come up with a theory. But I would like to point out something about lawyers that is well known, right? The rate of attorney depression is incredibly high. Some surveys, I think the there's like a mental health and substance abuse survey among lawyers, and it notes something like almost a third of all lawyers are depressed at some point, and that generally lawyers are just three times more likely to suffer depression than the average U.S. adult. And I say this quote because lawyers are very good at putting up a wall. We act all the time. When you are in court, you act. When you talk to a client, you act. You're railed out all the time by opposing counsel, by your clients, by judges. And your job is to have the world's best poker face and the world's friendliest poker face. That is what we are all called upon to do. So it is difficult also to really know what a good lawyer is thinking and if they're suffering from something. I think it's very noteworthy that he is very well respected in his community and that he was about to be deposed. It doesn't matter if you yourself have taken dozens of depositions in your career. To sit for a deposition is a completely different experience. I've never been deposed. I've never had to testify under oath. I have taken hundreds of people's testimony under oath. And I can tell you that if I had to sit under oath, I would have immense immense anxiety about it. He was about to have to sit under oath and be deposed. He had representation. He had liability. It didn't necessarily have to do with the fact that he was going to be personally liable. Insurance can cover that. That's not the point. 
this is kind of getting at the core of who you are. It's getting at the core of your reputation, of your integrity, of your abilities as a lawyer, your entire profession, kind of the core of your identity. And the fact that his file in the case disappears with him, I don't think is an accident, or at least I don't think it's something that can be easily discharged, at least at this point when we know so little. I just wonder if a lot was going on that he hid from his partners, that he hid from his wife and his daughter, and he maybe just wanted to get away for a little bit to clear his mind. Maybe this wasn't forever. This certainly didn't seem like it was forever, but when these sorts of issues occur, especially if you've never talked to anyone about them, his actions may actually seem somewhat in line with what someone in his position would have done if anyone would have known how he was feeling. The problem is we're getting a snapshot into his life without any idea what was happening behind his veneer. I think it's very noteworthy that a lot of people see him that weekend, but not a single person spoke to him that weekend. We know that people undergoing depression, kind of really deep-seated anxiety, tend to not speak about it. And so this is a well-known man in town. I think he was probably pretty social. To do well in private practice in a small town, you have to be a business developer. Business development means talking to people, making people like you so that they give you their business. He doesn't talk to a single person in that town that weekend. That's huge. It's the Super Bowl, a time when people get together with others. If anything, just to call and say, did you see that play? Or to plan on sitting together and watching it. Nothing. He has no connection to the outside world. And based on his profession and based on his positions within the community, I would venture to say that was unusual for him. So I just wonder if kind of all these pressures professionally were weighing on his mind in a way that seemed untenable and he just needed to get away. I don't necessarily think he meant to be away or to be killed at any point, but I'm not sure he was in his right mind in camo. Maybe in his kind of altered state, he thought, I can blend in, wear camo, be someone else for now. And it's not normal behavior to walk on the side of the road at 1030 in a small town that you have no connection to. But when your brain has kind of gone to the edges of its capacity to deal with the pressures, that could be very normal. So I, I just wonder if that's kind of what happened in this situation. So I want to add a few things to that. Number one, Alice is 100% right about depositions and lawyers. Lawyers are almost worse than most people. I think most people don't really know what they're, what they're getting themselves into, so they don't freak out quite as much. Lawyers are the worst. If you ever have to have a lawyer testify, I remember I prepared the general counsel for like a massive multinational bank once and he was the worst i mean he was just a wreck getting ready for a deposition and so alice is right i mean it certainly could be the fact that that that's part of this and whatever but one thing i want to say it is certainly true that lawyers are very good at hiding things like their depression and their anxieties but they're also very good at compartmentalizing things and so it could be that what he's hiding isn't depression, isn't anxiety. It's something else that's going on. And to me, it is certainly possible that David had some sort of mental break and just ran and ended up in Washington somehow. You know, maybe he flew from Dallas to L.A. and L.A. wasn't far enough away. So then he bought a ticket to Seattle and he flew up there and he thought Seattle's too big. I need to get somewhere that's completely out in the middle of nowhere. And for some reason he goes to Yakima. It's possible. And, and we don't know. And that's as good a theory as any. I think there's something going on here. And I think Alice's, what she's laid out is probably the most likely and probably the sort of Occam's razor approach here. I think there's more to it. I'm not sure what it is. And I don't think we'll ever know. I think there's, there's something going on and there's someone else involved. The $5,000 deposit into the bank account, that's significant to me. The fact that these tickets are being purchased, but they're return tickets, but the outbound tickets are different. Maybe that's because different people are buying the tickets. For whatever reason, he's buying the returns and they're buying the outbound or vice versa. 
And I just feel like he thought this wasn't as big a deal as maybe it turned out to be. And he thought everything was fine and he was living a normal life with the basketball goal. Like he was handling it, right? Like he was flying somewhere from Amarillo to handle it. And he flew to LA or planned to fly to LA to handle it, but it was handled. And so while he's doing that, as Alice was talking about compartmentalization, he's got that thing going on, but he also knows his daughter needs a basketball goal. So he goes to check that out and he thinks Sunday's going to be fine. I want to make some sandwiches and do some laundry and get ready for the game. And then something happens. He gets a phone call or somebody shows up at his house or something. And when that happens, it triggers, I've got to go. Maybe for the safety of his family, maybe for his own safety. Or maybe the person said, we flew out a couple days ago to deal with that one thing. And, you know, we're getting ready to go to LAX to deal with that other thing. But I need to meet you right now to deal with the other thing. Right. I mean, I don't know. Like I'm sort of, I'm in like breaking bad world now where, so he meets the guy and the guy's like, okay, you need to fly to LA to meet with the big guy and, and y'all can work this out. And David realizes if he actually flies to LA, he's going to die. So instead he flies to Washington and ends up in Yakima and gets run over. And that's completely unrelated. I don't know. You know, you could write a lot of great short stories about this or pilots for your TV series. But to me, there is just something going on below the surface that we don't know. And whether it is something that eventually drove him crazy so that he did this, or he made the very rational decision for himself and for his family to get as far away from Amarillo as possible. It's one of those two things. I don't know what it is. I wish there had been more investigation in this case. I wish there had been more focus on this case in 1993. It does feel like one of those cases that, how are you going to crack this one? And we got a big piece of evidence in 2004, but even that's 18 years ago now. So I don't know. Love to hear your theories on this. And we're probably going to follow up with this at some point. If you guys have some good theories and more information, there's not a ton of information out there. Like I said, you can listen to the trail went cold. There was a really good Reddit post about this that had a lot of good information, but for the most part, that's really all there is. And talk about a case that lives up to its hype of just, there's no cold water to pour on this. Like This is just as bizarre as it sounds. Yeah. And if somebody out there knows something that solves this case, like somebody discovered a letter that explained the whole thing, please let us know because this is one of those that's going to eat at me and I'm going to wonder about and think about for a long time. So we really are excited to hear what you guys think. Hopefully the wisdom of the crowd can overcome this one. Shoot us up at prosecutorspod at gmail.com, at prosecutorspod for all your social media. If you're on YouTube, feel free to comment. If you're on Patreon, listening to this early and ad-free, I'm sure the comments are going crazy. Join us on the gallery on Facebook, where you'll find some of the most intelligent true crime commentators out there. And if you ever want to hear about a case, and you know of a case like this one that's weird and strange and that people would enjoy hearing, let us know. This is not a case I had ever heard of. It never would have been on my radar had it not been for you guys. And you guys drive this show and you drive what we cover. And we really enjoy discovering these new cases and walking through them with you. Alice, before we sign off, is there anything else you want to talk about? Whew, this one, you know, that's funny. At the beginning, we didn't know if we'd have enough to fill an episode. And I think this just shows you we can talk about anything <laughs> <laughs> for a long time. But this was a fascinating case. So thank you guys for recommending it. I had never heard of it either. And I'll just go ahead and tell you, we got another one next week. And it's going to be more than one episode. And it is strange. It's not unknown like this one. It's very well known and highly recommended by you folks, which is why we're going to cover it and we're going to do our best to figure out what happened in that incredibly strange case as well. Fortunately, that one has a lot more evidence than this one does, so we will see what we can do, but that's next week. And until then, I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. And we are The Prosecutor. You have me obsessed with D.B. Cooper, man. I'm going to go watch. D.B. Cooper. D.B. Cooper. And the money he took. 
Where was the money from? Was it just on the plane? Well, I mean, he was asking for $200,000, so I guess the FBI got it together, marked bills or something. And they threw it into the air and he caught it? Did he also ask for No, a... he landed the plane. That's amazing. He let the passengers off, he got the money, and they took off again. Uh oh, he got the money when he left the passengers off. been to Austin, I've been to Dallas, been to Fort Worth, been to San Antonio, been to El Paso. All right, you've been a lot of I've been a lot of places. Your point. <laughs> but I haven't been like, you know, to the good, to the prairie or whatever, whatever it is they call it. It would Texas. be fun to go to a ranch in Texas. There you go. A ranch in Texas is pretty awesome. Maybe your next ranch can be a Texas ranch. All this month, stream the funniest films for free on Pluto TV. Watch comedy classics like Anchorman, The Legend of Ron Burgundy, and Mean Girls. Or drop in for a Tyler Perry marathon with a Medea family funeral and Medea's witness protection. Pluto TV also has hundreds of channels and thousands of movies and TV shows like Get Shorty, Be Cool, Key and Peel, Comedy and Color, and more. And no contracts, no subscriptions, no fees, no joke. So download the Pluto TV app on your favorite streaming device and start laughing today. Pluto TV, drop in, watch free.